Good morning and welcome to Cato. I'm Marianne Tupi. I'm a senior policy analyst uh, here at the Cato Institute and I'm the editor of uh, humanprogress.org. I want to welcome you all to the Cato Institute and also I want to welcome all those who are watching us online. Here at Cato, we pride ourselves on our unashamed defense of free markets. Free markets lead to growth and growth leads to wealth. Wealth buys better hospitals, schools, sanitations, and infrastructure, thus benefiting the society as a whole. Compared to our ancestors, we live longer, freer, healthier, more educated, and safer lives. We enjoy choices that people in the past did not even dream, dream about. Yet not all is well in the state of Denmark, as Marcellus puts it in Shakespeare's Hamlet. While we do not have longitudinal studies on anxiety and depression and cannot therefore be sure if today is really all that different from the past, maybe we'll discuss that later, um, we do know for a fact that people in advanced Western countries suffer from anxiety and depression at higher rates than people in less prosperous countries. Put differently, rich people are more anxious than poor people. Is economic advancement to blame? And if so, how can we address the problem of anxiety whilst at the same time preserving the blessings of liberty and free markets? That will be the subject of our discussion today. Dr. Clay Routledge is a psycho psychological scientist, writer, consultant, public speaker, and professor. He studies basic psychological needs and how these needs influence and are influenced by family, social and community bonds, economics, and broader cultural worldviews. Much of his research focuses on the need for meaning in life. He has published over 100 scholarly papers, co-edited two books on existential psychology, and authored the books on nostalgia and supernatural. His work has been featured by many media outlets, such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, CBS, ABC, BBC, The Atlantic, The New Yorker, and so forth. He's a professor of psychology at North Dakota State University and a senior fellow at the Institute of Family Studies. He's also a non-resident scholar for the Baylor University Institute for Studies of Religion. Jason Kuznicki is the editor of Cato Books and of Cato Unbound, the Cato Institute's online journal of debate. His first book, Technology and the End of Authority, What is Government For?, surveys Western political theory from a libertarian perspective. Kuznicki uh, was the assistant editor of the Encyclopedia of Libertarianism. He earned his PhD in history from Johns Hopkins University in 2005 where his work was offered both a Fulbright Fellowship and a Chateaubriand Prize. Prize. Clay will kick off our discussion with a 20-minute opening. Uh, we will then turn to Jason for his opening remarks of 20 minutes. Uh, there will be a five-minute rebuttal from each, from each speaker and a 30-minute Q&A. So with that, let me hand it over to Clay. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me here to, to engage in this discussion with everyone on what I think is a very important and timely topic. I'm sure I don't need to remind this audience of the various ways throughout human history that the state has threatened individual autonomy, liberty, and ultimately human flourishing. As a general rule, humans have a natural inclination towards self-determination. We don't like being manipulated, dominated, controlled, or oppressed. Studies show that even in more collectivist societies where people tend to privilege group harmony over personal feelings and opinions, well-being is best facilitated and maintained when people feel self-determined. In other words, psychological freedom is a powerful force, even in societies that are far less individualistic than our own. However, the absence of the state or other forms of social control 
doesn't automatically mean humans are thriving as free agents. In fact, many people may willingly submit to or advocate for more state control over their lives or turn to authoritarian leaders and ideas if their freedom brings anxiety, loneliness, alienation, and chaos. That is, they will sacrifice freedom for psychological, social, and economic security. Thus, I believe the focus on ways in which the state threatens freedom and human flourishing should be matched by a focus on what we might call organic or non-government mediated structures that facilitate sustainable freedom, a society that can succeed with as little government interference as possible. Today, I'd like to focus on the importance of meaning in life for the health and sustainability of a free society. At some level, all animals must make sense of the world in order to navigate it. But humans are unique in that we are highly self-aware and self-reflective, distinctly positioned to ask big questions about our existence and our role in the world. As self-conscious organisms, our efforts to make sense of the world extend to our own lives. And our cognitive sophistication gives us agency, a sense of self-direction that makes us goal-oriented. We don't just want to live, we want lives that matter. We need our lives to have meaning. Many people acknowledge the importance of meaning for mental and even physical health. A large body of research shows that a lack of meaning is a major risk factor for depression, anxiety, drug and alcohol abuse, and suicide. What people often don't think about, and what I, though I think we need to advocate for more, is the vital role that meaning plays in people's ability to successfully navigate a free society in both good and bad times. Meaning helps people govern themselves, and it helps them find the hope and courage to move forward with self-determination when life gets difficult. Imagine two guys getting up in the morning. One views his life as full of meaning and purpose, and that his existence matters. He believes he has an important role to play in society, and thus a duty to others. The other guy views his life as not particularly meaningful, that it really doesn't matter. He doesn't believe he has an important role in the world and feels no sense of duty or obligation to others. Which one of these two guys do you think is going to be more motivated at work, able to take on new challenges, and resilient against stress and difficulties in life? Which one do you think will be able to resist temptation, or as my wife would say, make good choices, and stay focused on important goals? Which one do you think will be able to dig deep and find the inspiration to build, create, and innovate when the odds are stacked against him? Said differently, which one do you think will be more likely to regulate his behavior in healthy ways that benefit him and the broader society? My argument is that meaning is an existential self-regulatory resource that plays a central role in society, and the success of a free society in particular. In the, experience my research, in the experiments my research team conducts, we find that when people's attention is focused on what gives their lives meaning, they are more motivated to pursue their goals. They are more optimistic and confident. They have what is referred to as an approach-oriented mindset. That is, they, are, they aren't defensive or ruminative, anxious or fearful or pessimistic. Meaning pushes them outward. It makes them more positive, bold, and hopeful. The more people view their lives as meaningful, the more they are engaged, inspired, disciplined, and focused. This self-regulatory function of meaning extends to the broader social world. For example, in a, recent steam, uh, in a recent study my team conducted, we found that meaning was a strong and unique predictor of community volunteering, charitable giving, and a focus on community goals. When people feel meaningful, they aren't just better able to take care of themselves, they are more oriented towards helping others and to building communities. Experimental research provides further support for this relationship. When people's attention is focused on the life experiences that give them meaning, they are more inspired to assist others. Meaning in life brings online the pro-social self. Therefore, a crisis of meaning isn't just a threat to an individual, it is a threat to a free society. So how do people find meaning in life? And what are the possible warning signs of a crisis of meaning? Though people find meaning in diverse ways, research identifies certain social, cultural, and psychological structures as robust sources of meaning in life. Religion has long provided a framework for meaning. Religious beliefs help people feel like they matter by offering them teleological meaning, the belief that they exist for a reason. Religion also pro promotes meaning by providing people a way to order their lives and to find strength in the face of tragedy. 
Critically, religion shepherds people towards each other into moral communities that help them find social value and social support. This isn't to say that religion doesn't cause problems. In fact, religion in its more extreme forms can be a threat to freedom. But for most believers in a free society, religion is a social and cultural structure that weaves them together into interdependent communities and helps them navigate the life stressors and uncertainty that threaten meaning. In this way, religion supports freedom by aiding existential self-regulation. But religion is just one part of the story. Studies from my team find that people, religious and non-religious alike, find meaning in family and close personal relationships. And a large body of research supports a strong link between social connection and meaning. But I would emphasize that it isn't just that being liked or surrounded by nice people that is important. It's that feeling that one truly matters that generates meaning. People can be surrounded by people who like them, but still feel lonely, insignificant, and even like a burden. This might help explain why parenting and marriage are also predictors of meaning. The more, people, the more intimately we are connected to others and the more we accept that we have a moral duty to them, the more we feel needed, that we have a purposeful role to play in a meaningful cultural drama. Generally speaking, the people who are most invested in social and cultural structures that make their existence feel purposeful, that they serve a vital social function, a function that is often engendered by a moral duty, the more they perceive their lives as meaningful. Based on this, I believe there are reasons to be concerned about a crisis of meaning. From faith, family, interdependent community life, and a shared commitment to a range of American values and institutions, the foundations of our existential health are under stress. Americans, particularly younger adults, are increasingly skeptical of both religious and secular traditional social and cultural structures. A Wall Street Journal NBC survey conducted in 1998 found that about 70% of Americans reported patriotism is very important. Today, that number is around 60%. Two decades ago, over 60% of Americans said religion is very important. That number is down to 50% today. Today, only 43% of Americans say having children is important down 16% from 1998. The numbers become, the contrasts become more stark if you go further back. A recent Pew survey finds that young adults are less confident in many of our institutions and less trusting of people in general. 70% of adults under the age of 30 believe people just look out for themselves. Pew classified nearly half of young adults as being low trusters, people who see others as selfish, exploitative, and untrustworthy rather than helpful, fair, and trustworthy. According to the World Value Survey, only about 30% of Americans born after 1980 believe it's absolutely essential to live in a democratic country, compared with 70% of Americans who were born before World War II. These cultural shifts might help explain why conservatives are more likely than liberals to perceive their lives as meaningful, an effect that is observed in large samples in the US, Canada, and across Europe, and one that is more strongly associated with social conservatism than economic conservatism. It is worth noting a recent study of Americans conducted by the folks here at Cato found similar results. In, in fact, this survey found that only 39% of liberals strongly agreed that their lives have meaning, compared to 51% of libertarians and 58% of conservatives. In addition, only 36% of people who never attend religious services strongly agree their lives have meaning in this Cato survey, compared to 68% of those who attend weekly. Similar patterns emerge when looking at meaning as a function of age. Younger adults are less likely to view their lives as meaningful than older adults. Younger adults also report having fewer friends and people that they can depend on and higher levels of loneliness. In many ways, our modern affluent and liberal individualistic society promotes the opposite of what leads to secure and stable meaning. We are encouraged to find ourselves, to love ourselves as we are, that we don't need the approval of others to have value. This is a nice sounding self-help story, but it is more fantasy than fact. Ironically, Americans often recognize the importance of cultural structures and practices outside of our own society. Perhaps liberal individualism makes people imagine our society as post-cultural, a place where people are the architects of their own meaning frameworks. But this is not how meaning works. Many of you might think I sound like an old man waxing nostalgic about the good old days and how we need to return to the way things were, I want to be clear that that's not at all what I'm doing. Historians don't study the past because they long to return to it. They study it because they know there are lessons we can learn going forward. I believe we need to be forward looking, but that we also would be naive or arrogant if we think that there are no lessons to learn 
by studying the intrapsychic, social, and cultural variables that have stay, sustained meaning in past generations. Short of a cataclysmic event like we see in popular apocalyptic science fiction stories, we aren't going back to the way things were. And I don't want to go back. Liberalism has benefited society in many ways. It has played an important role in reducing prejudice and discrimination, and has helped people cultivate their unique gifts, allowing them to make valuable contributions to society. But that doesn't mean we ignore the reality of the human condition and the existential vulnerabilities liberalism creates. Let me provide one relevant example from my own research on the psychology of religion and spirituality. There's very good reason to believe that most people have a natural inclination towards spirituality. We are a species that longs for transcendence. This doesn't mean that people are hardcore believers in the supernatural, some are, some aren't. But most people have something that pulls them towards the idea that existence cannot be completely reduced to purely material and transient life on this planet. Humans naturally tend to view this self and our connections to others as expanding beyond the confines of the material body. In fact, it is common for people to report feeling the presence of a loved one who has died. Interestingly, as traditional religious beliefs and practices have been in decline in the Western world, non-traditional supernatural and paranormal beliefs have been increasing. In other words, people leaving religion is not necessarily evidence that they are rejecting all things supernatural and fully embracing a secular worldview based on an empirical understanding of reality. It appears that many of these people are looking elsewhere to fill a spiritual void. Our research finds that the need for meaning is a strong predictor of non-traditional, supernatural, and paranormal beliefs ranging from belief in spiritual energy, clairvoyance, ghosts, witchcraft, and narratives that involve godlike alien beings manipulating human behavior. However, critically, we also find that these non-traditional beliefs are driven by the need for meaning, but they aren't necessarily doing a good job of providing people with meaning. But why? This is where there are lessons we can learn from what has worked in the past. The success of religion in shaping a world of meaning and purpose may be tied to the fact that religion generally orients people towards one another. It facilitates interdependent family and community bonds. It calls for a social duty to others. Religion also symbolically connects people across time and space. It facilitates cultural continuity. These connections create stable and secure sources of meaning that many new age and non-traditional beliefs may not. This is just one example, but it brings to mind another recent historical movement we should learn from. In the last quarter of the 20th century, America largely embraced the self-esteem campaign. This movement was the result, or at least perfectly fit, into our affluent individualistic society. The idea is that we could simply teach our kids to view themselves positively, independent of external contingencies. Everyone gets a trophy, everyone is awesome, and though this sounds great, it did not lead to the outcomes many predicted. Attempting to artificially cultivate positive self-regard did not make us happier, healthier, and better able to navigate the social world. Arguably, it increased psychological and social fragility and made us more selfish, anxious, and entitled, perhaps. We should be mindful not to make the same mistake with meaning. Again, this is why I believe it is critical that we understand how deep, stable, and enduring meaning is created and preserved. Quick self-help fixes won't work. The individualistic view that everyone can simply generate their own meaning sounds appealing, but it is not consistent with the evidence. Because our society is so individualistic, it is hard for us to step outside of it and approach the issue in an unbiased way, but that is what we should do. Humans weren't fashioned in a laboratory by modern Western scientists. The basic motives and cognitive processes and neural architecture that drive us did not change just because our world has changed. The good news is that humans do have a plasticity that renders us agentic, able to adapt to change and navigate a complex world. But this doesn't negate our core nature. Perhaps we're existential victims of our own economic success. A recent cross-cultural study of human flourishing comparing the US to other countries such as China, Cambodia, and Mexico found that though the US scored highest on financial and material stability, it scored lowest on a number of indicators of flourishing, including close social relationships and meaning in life. The more money and material comforts we have, the easier it is for us to believe we don't really need to rely on other people. But this goes both ways. The same variables that make me feel like I don't need others can also make them feel like they don't need me. And if no one needs me, what purpose do I serve? But we are not powerless, passive organisms. Research also shows that a sense of personal agency or control 
and the belief in free will positively contribute to meaning in life. In other words, psychological freedom is an existential resource that we can use to find and restore meaning. In the recent Cato survey I previously mentioned, while only 30% of people who indicated having little belief in personal agency strongly endorsed the idea that their lives have meaning, 68% of people who reported a strong belief in personal agency agreed that their lives have meaning. This is one of the reasons that I'm concerned that it has become fashionable among certain segments of academia and social commentators to reject the idea of psychological freedom and personal responsibility. Of course, our lives are shaped by forces outside of our personal control, but completely ignoring human agency is a mistake. And the relationship between psychological freedom and meaning is likely bi-directional. It is true that in our modern technology-driven world, we're increasingly vulnerable to manipulation and are, surrounding, are surrendering our personal data to companies endeavoring to hack the human brain. But the fact that we are aware of this and can contemplate and debate the consequences of this reveals that we aren't powerless. We have the ability to act with purpose. I certainly do not have all the answers, but the one thing I am confident about is the vital role that meaning plays in protecting and broadening freedom and critically helping people thrive in a free society. If we don't want more and more people turning inward and surrendering to a demotivated, self-indulgent, cynical, and nihilistic state, or turning to authoritarian ideas and leaders in a desperate attempt to restore some sense of existential security, then we need to identify and nourish the ingredients of a meaningful life in this modern age. Thank you. I suppose by way of response, the appropriate place to begin is to start by telling you all that your lives don't have any meaning. <laughs> and to go from there to saying that that's OK, because it doesn't really matter. You, you don't have that much to live for. It's all right. I'm going to let you down. Uh, but that's not what I'm going to do. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a question that sounds very closely related, which is to ask, why are we here? We are here specifically, not, not, I'm not talking about the human condition here, I'm talking about a Cato policy forum on meaning. If we are here because of a personal search for the transcendent, then I would suggest we all need to go home. Because a personal search for the transcendent does not need government policy. It is yours to conduct as you see fit. This is one of the great innovations of the Enlightenment, that we have the capacity to develop a relationship with the transcendent that does not have to be mitigated or mediated by the government. It can be us with our churches, with our families, with whatever spiritual guides or advisors or holy books that we think are relevant, but the folks with the guns, they need to stand aside. That, to me, is a really important idea. In all of human history, it seems to have occurred very rarely, and still rarer has it been successfully carried out. But we live in one of the societies where it has been. And we ought to remember that and hold on to it. So if we're here for a public policy reason, I, I'm not really sure that we should be doing it at a Cato policy forum, because this is an idea that, that libertarians have always taken to and always thought is a good one. What then, what I, what I have to ask, what is the nature of this search? Are we really searching for meaning itself? Or are people who say that they are searching for meaning much more often searching for the power to impose their meaning on others? And that's where I, as a libertarian, would have to reach for my revolver. I mean, I get nervous about stuff like this. With, with all due respect to our guest, I worry that a lot of people who live in the same neighborhood intellectually as, as his are not putting this search for meaning to a very libertarian end. They know very well what meaning life has. They are concerned that you don't share it, and they want to make certain that you do. And that's where I have to say I have a great deal of anxiety uh, not as a first worlder or westerner or whatever, but as a libertarian who is contemplating uh, the policy implications of all of this. And I'll give a couple of examples. It is true that in general, religiosity has declined in the United States, but it has declined from a very high baseline 
And it has not yet reached anything like the levels of religiosity in other industrialized Western countries. Uh, so I, I'm not certain that that's really necessarily a cause for alarm. However, within American religiosity, there has been a counter trend recently toward a very strident, very uh, dogmatic, hidebound return to arch traditionalism. And uh, especially this tendency seems very apt to me to run into and want to break the libertarian barriers that have been set up between church and state. And I am very concerned about the uh, sort of resurrection of the religious right in, in this way. So I'm sure that they have solved the problem of life's meaning for them. What I would like, though, is for them to leave me alone or to leave me out of it. So that's one example. The second example is I think of our president's recent campaign rally in Minnesota in which he called out legally resident Somali Americans as an example of something that he wanted to demonize. He held up the whole country of Somalia to get booed. And I'm very sure that the people who were enthusiastically booing Somalia and the desperate people who came to the United States to make a better life here, I'm sure that they feel that their life is imbued with meaning. But that kind of nationalistic meaning is also a very dangerous one. That uh, it may be the case that we need some measure of, of collective assurance or some measure of, of uh, collective uh, validation for ourselves, but this does seem to be taking it in a very dangerous direction to me. So I, I, I am concerned that the search for meaning not shade into a search for the imposition of meaning on others and the imposition of, in particular, certain very exclusionary, potentially uh, quite violent forms of imposition of meaning on others. As the philosopher Karl Popper described it, we want history to have meaning, uh, but uh, this is, he said, it's, it, ultimately it's an aesthetic search. We want the course of our civilization or of our nation to have some sort of an appealing narrative to it where our civilization rises and progresses and it's going someplace. But this is an artistic endeavor. And we might wish, Popper said, we might wish for the artist to have chosen a better medium. Because this medium, after all, is the lives of other people. It is nothing else. It is just the lives of other people that we wish to impose ourselves on. So I'm, I'm very skeptical about this. When we get into the question of mattering, which is a little bit different, I'm not sure that we are much helped. When, when we talk about whether our life matters in the grand scheme of things or in the broad sweep of history, uh, that seems like it's maybe even a shorter shortcut to danger. And I'll give an example of what I mean. In fourth century BC Greece, one of the most vibrant times culturally that has ever been known in all of world history, there was a guy by the name of Herostratus. And you might have heard of him, but he wasn't a great philosopher. He wasn't a great scientist. He was not a great poet. None of the things that we know the fourth century BC Greece to, to have produced. He was a great arsonist. He burned down the temple of Artemis and did it because why? He wanted to matter. He wanted his life to be remembered. He wanted it to be important. And uh, sure enough, we remember Herostratus. Uh, we remember him. He made his mark on history. And I would suggest that there's something really dangerous about wanting to make your mark on history simply for its own sake. This is not something that can be called good. This is not something that can be called uh, meaningful in, in the true or the proper sense. Perhaps, perhaps he was proud that he did it. Maybe it took a lot of ingenuity to burn down this great ancient wonder. Uh, but uh, 
it's not something that I think, morally speaking, we can call a good life. And, and this is another danger, I would, I would say, about uh, the search for meaning in life. Now, I do empathize a great deal with the wish that one's personal life might find a communal affirmation. But I would suggest that this is more possible now than ever before in our Western, industrialized, even somewhat secular societies. It is more possible than ever before because if you are a traditional Christian, then great, you have a community to return to. If you are secular or a follower of other religions, you will not be persecuted as you build your community to return to, to find meaning from. We are all engaged in a search for meaning. We're just not on the same paths anymore. And hopefully that can continue to be okay. Hopefully that can continue to be an experiment long into the future because we've tried the other way. We have tried being a monoculture in which Christianity is the way to find meaning. And not just Christianity, but it's got to be specifically Catholic Christianity or specifically Calvinist Christianity or specifically Lutheran Christianity and none others are tolerated. And that doesn't work. We may be stuck with pluralism. We may be stuck with only a small share of that pie being people who are in our faith or our uh, moral community as regards meaning. But that might be the best that we can do if we also want to have the wide scale cooperation that brings mass prosperity. We might have to lower our horizons. We might have to resign ourselves to not mattering in the way that Herostratus did to not having left a mark on history, which by the way, most people don't. I mean, I'm up here at the podium now and none of you are, but I'm also gonna be forgotten. I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, I think that this is, while not terribly inspiring, perhaps the only way forward. Thank you very much. So let's do a five minute uh, rebuttal each. First Clay, then, uh, then, uh, then Jason. I'll, I'll let you know when to stop. Please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I think those are all excellent points. I share the view that we don't really want the government involved in transcendence as, uh, as much as, and our you know campaigns for transcendence as, as much as possible. And this is why I you know I think that it's not you know it's not a policy proposal. So I, I, I agree with that. You know I think that we have the tendency to talk about all the ways to prevent the government from doing things that you know, threaten us or, you know, threaten our liberty that, and that's great, um, but that we also need to focus on getting people to do things with their freedom to build, um, you know, to build the social structures that rend American values and relevant, which I would agree. This is something libertarians tend to, you know, tend to agree with, but it, you got to go beyond the abstract of saying, yeah, people need to do this on their own without the government and actually figure out how to get people to do it on their own without the government. So I think the, you know, the implications, the policy imp imp implications for this are, you know, are difficult to know for sure, but something doesn't seem to be going well um, for many people in terms of being able to find connections. So there was a recent YouGov survey that found that 30% of millennials report feeling lonely most of the time. Blue Cross Blue Shield Health Index says since 2013, millennials have had a 47% increase in depression diagnoses. The number is 40% in the UK. Now there's all sorts of challenges to these types of metrics because you know people will raise issues of concept creep and ultimately we're asking people to, you know, to, to reflect on their own condition. So maybe what we think of as mental health has, has changed, but there's a number of behavioral indicators as well that should concern us from um, 
from trends such as suicide, but also just in general, more social disengagement and, and more distrust of each other. Um, I wanna also you know, make the point that I think is, is you know, that Jason made, which is, which is good, which is he said he doesn't want the state to tell him or he doesn't want one religious group to tell him that they have the answer for meaning. And I would agree, but you know, there's this interesting reality of, of human nature, which there is a tension between freedom and, and security, that if we want to maximize freedom, we have to understand this vulnerability that when people feel dislodged, or anxious, or alienated, they will often surrender freedom and in exchange for security. And so it's easy to say, let's, you know, let's, I don't want to tell anyone else what to do, and I don't want anyone to tell me what to do. But um, I would argue that we do have some moral duty to each other, you know, to our neighbors and our community members, not telling them what to do, but help them to, to feel like they're part of a, a meaningful community. Um, on the issue of mattering, um, empirically mattering is um, the strongest predictor of people's perceptions of meaning. But I, luckily, I don't think most people are as ambitious as you wanting to matter on some grand historic scale. Most people's sense of mattering comes from family, community, and much more local efforts, right? A parent feels like they matter when they see their kids thriving, right? Um, a worker might feel like they matter when they see their contributions to their work are being acknowledged by others. And there's actually been some, some research on this comparing different types of work environments. And you know, people from in hospitals, from janitors to, you know, to nurses and doctors are more mentally healthy and feel more meaningful when they feel like other people recognize that they're an important part of the treatment team. So mattering often happens at a smaller scale. Thankfully, most people don't have um, dramatic am ambitions in terms of you know, having larger effects than that. Um, but I would also say that, I'm out of time, right? Actually, yeah. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> no, no, just say one more thing. So yeah, I think it's, you know, I think, you know, I'm actually in agreement a lot uh, with Jason and I, you know, I also worry about trying to impose meaning. We have a long history, of course, of people thinking they have the answer and forcing it on others and then looking back and being like, well, that was a, that was a disaster. Um, but that doesn't mean we just stand back and do nothing. Um, we don't have to get the government involved, but we, ha we have to get involved with building healthy communities and in sustainable ways. So uh, do we have rising social disengagement and distrust? This sounds like it's an empirical question, but it's actually difficult to quantify. As, as the familiar meme, which maybe you've seen before, puts it, uh, not so long ago, we were told, never get into a stranger's car, don't meet with strange people off the internet, and uh, now we all take Uber and do both of those things all the time. Um, we are conditioned by the media, which does it more or less deliberately. We are conditioned to think that crime is always high and always rising, when in fact, crime levels right now are somewhere around where they were in the early 1960s, which is to say the lowest that has ever been recorded. We are not experiencing the kinds of trends that one might expect with social breakdown. In fact, we are becoming a much more uh, dynamic society in a lot of ways. We have seen enormous amounts of social change and yet we've been surprisingly resilient to it. So uh, I don't know. I don't know how we can get at this problem. In some ways, it seems like maybe there is social disengagement and distrust, but in other ways, it seems like we are uh, undergoing some strains and yet overcoming them and doing quite well at it. So uh, I don't know that we can uh, nail down exactly uh, the assertion that there is a problem and, and then proceed to work on solving it. It's, it's not necessarily clear to me that that is a problem. Um, mattering in terms of local contexts Sounds great to me. Uh, I hope you matter to your family and your workplace and to your local community. And if everyone could uh, aspire to that, that seems like an aspiration 
that is a lot healthier than the aspiration to uh, burn down a famous temple or the aspiration to be the one who finally got Americans to hate Somalis properly. Uh, so I would suggest that, yes, those are, these are very good, healthy suggestions and that uh, possibly they are good antidotes to the strong tendency of the internet to make us uh, uh, cast our communal nets across the entire world at perhaps the expense of our local communities in the physical world. So uh, uh, I like this, I tentatively approve of it, I'm curious to see what can come out of it, and yet at the same time I don't want to lose my uh, far-flung international internet community, which I'm sure a lot of you also have in your own ways and also enjoy and benefit greatly from. So uh, some kind of balance seems in order between geographically close and geographically far away, and it should not be surprising that a society undergoing the types of changes that we are now undergoing should struggle with exactly this issue. Of course it's going to be difficult for us. We're doing this for the very first time. It's gonna be tricky. So uh, uh, I think that there's a lot more uh, room for dialogue here. There are some points of agreement that uh, we can build on and also some remaining disagreements and I guess we should uh, head over to questions now. Perhaps begin by asking the first question um, very briefly. Um, Clay, do I understand that, I mean, would you agree that um, uh, it was the crowding out of civil society uh, by the welfare state, which perhaps has uh, undermined many of the ways in which uh, uh, people have interacted with one another um, before? let's say, the Great Society, and is that, is that a concrete proposal, uh, returning welfare and community support back to, well, communities mm -hmm. rather than governments? Would that be one of your proposals for um, a renewed uh, engagement? Uh, and what other concrete proposals do you think there are? And Jason, a quick question for you, and that is that, uh, obviously a critic of uh, your position and to a great extent mine and perhaps um, of uh, uh, Cato would be, what do we have to say about, uh, say, mass shootings of people who uh, do come from a very similar demogra uh, demographic, um, these disenchanted bad boys who look for mattering in the way that Herostratus did, but not by burning down a temple but shooting up a high school. Do we, do we, uh, um, is that an issue that we should be addressing or, um, or is there not a problem there uh, because ultimately the, um, uh, the number of people who die in these shootings and uh, various mis ma mass killings is not actually on a dramatic rise upwards. So let's open it with those two questions and then uh, go to Q&A. Okay. Yeah, so in regards to the question about the, the welfare state, it's a difficult one and I'm not, I mean, that's, I'm a psychologist, right? This isn't, you know, necessarily my area of expertise, but I do think it's true if you look at a number of, uh, of indicators when you have the state doing things that people may be used to or maybe people would believe should do for each other or feel responsible for themselves, it does you know, take away some sense of that interdependent moral duty. So you can look at this in ways such as the amount of nonprofit work that does come from religious organizations, for instance. And one of the arguments when looking at disaster relief, for instance, that, that religious organization, organizations might be better than, than the government is that not only do they tend to be more local and so they know the people and the needs of the people, they stick around longer, right? They're not just there for the immediate cleanup. They provide a longer you know, social support system. In addition to that, there is something that you know, might be hard to quantify 
that comes from the feeling that people are helping you because they care, as opposed to it's their job. And, you know, I remember reading about this, um, the story in, I think it was in Oklahoma, and it was an interfaith effort. So it was Christians, Muslims, and, you know, some other groups coming together to put this, put this event together for kids going back to school who didn't have everything they needed to go back to school because their parents couldn't afford new school clothes and backpacks and school supplies and even haircuts and, and things like that. And so all these religious groups came together and provided you know, this, this free event that kids can come to and get everything they needed to go back to school. So they would go to school, you know, not feeling excluded or, you know, because they don't have new things or, you know, a nice new backpack or new school clothes or, you know, don't have a nice, you know, haircut. And some of the things that people were saying who went to that event is it felt, it wasn't just that they got these material possessions it really had an impact on them that people were doing that freely, that, that people in the community cared enough about them to take their free time and their money to come help them. It wasn't a social worker. It wasn't somebody that said, this is what you have to, you have to be here from nine to five to help these kids. People did it on their, on their own. And when I talk about this concept of, of psychological freedom, you know, that's kind of what I'm getting at. This sense of, of you can do whatever you want but when people choose to orient that freedom towards communities, towards helping others, it renders the government less important. And one of the best ways to get the government out of people's lives, perhaps, is to make it not necessary and to make people think it's not necessary. So from that perspective, I think maybe there is something, you know, something to, that, to that point you raise. Um, I would like to respond a little bit to both. Uh, first, yes, it's obviously not enough to say that mass shootings are rare. Uh, obviously, that's, uh, that's cold comfort, and, uh, and I don't want to endorse saying, okay, that's good enough. I, I think that one of the more insightful uh, analyses of the phenomenon that I've seen actually comes from Malcolm Gladwell, who has characterized the uh, repeated, almost scripted uh, incidents of, of mass shootings, particularly in schools in the United States, as uh, a kind of subculture. And that there are, whether we like it or not, people who follow this subculture very closely, who identify with it, and who aspire to one day join the ranks of mass shooters. Uh, it's hard not to see a, a search for, for mattering in that. And it's hard not to see that there is a kind of cultural propagation of this action that uh, it's managed to pass from one person to the next to the next. So, so uh, uh, what can we do to stop that? And the first thing I think that could be done is to make it less glamorous. Stop romanticizing it. Stop giving these people their names in the newspapers if we can. It might be might be something that needs to be done voluntarily, but I think it could be done. And I think that uh, when we do glamorize them, when we do make mass shooters into uh, these uh, great evil demons up on a pedestal, well, we're, we're kind of giving them what they want. And uh, maybe we should stop that. Uh, that seems to me a, a possible avenue of, uh, of uh, response to the problem that I don't think has been sufficiently examined. Now, as to the question of uh, deriving meaning from providing personal service in, in charity, I, I think that there's certainly something to that. But if you talk with people who run food banks and you ask, well, what can I give you? They are happy to accept your food donations, which is what you probably want to give because you derive meaning from that. The act of feeding someone is very personal. It's almost intimate, and that's what you want. But what they secretly want is your money. And they want your money because they can buy wholesale. They can respond to community needs better with money because they know what they have on hand from one week to the next, and it changes. They know that they can take advantage of this or that deal in the near future because that's part of their job, to know when these types of things are available. And to do that, they need your money. 
Money isn't intimate, it isn't personal, it doesn't feel like you're doing the same kind of thing even if it's the same dollar value of food. It feels cold, it feels distant, it feels like you're not really building community. But in some ways you are helping more when you do give money. So there's a trade-off here. There's a trade-off between really helping and having the feeling that you help while helping in a less efficient way. And we ought to take a very careful look at that because we want to have people deriving meaning, yes, but we also want people with full bellies. We want people who go to a food bank to come away with nutritious food. And to do that maximally may be in some tension with donors' feelings of helpfulness. And uh, I don't have a formula for how to balance the two out, but it seems clear to me that there is a significant trade-off between them. Thank you very much to both of you. Fascinating. Okay, uh, let's uh, do q and I'm not sure if we have mics today. Yes, we do. So, you know, the usual rules, uh, if you would please uh, tell us your name and uh, uh, who your paymaster is. And I beg of you to make your questions snappy and in a form of a question. Uh, first, Phil Harvey. Thanks. It seems to me we've gotten a bit away from the question that Marion uh, opened with uh, that, that relates to the degree of depression and drug addiction and suicide most immediately and particularly in the United States. I wonder if you both could address the question of if it is true that affluent societies have a sub substantially greater problem with these afflictions, uh, presumably because so many people do not feel they have meaning in their lives, uh, and or feel they are not needed. Um, and, and why that is a problem of affluence uh, and much less of a problem uh, uh, of poverty. You want me to go first? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so at the basic level, it is true empirically that in more affluent societies, people score lower on indicators of social connectedness and, and meaning in life in terms of, the, you know, so you have people fill out these questionnaires and, and, you know, the richer the country it is, the less people, you know, feel meaning and, and connected, even though they have more, you know, material security. Now, how that causally connects to affluence, I think, is a difficult question because a lot of these things are just, are just correlations. Now, when we get into the laboratory and study these things, you maybe start to be able to build an empirically-based theoretical model um, from, from experimental work um, that kind of you know, reveals the, the, the paradox, perhaps, of affluence. And that is, you can imagine in a, a poor society in which people are, their day-to-day -day, you know, efforts, they can directly see their contribution to themselves and to their families because they're trying to survive. Now, we don't think that's ideal, right? We, you know, no one wants to you know, go back to that way of living despite the fact that we seem to fantasize about it a lot in terms of our, um, the fiction we choose to consume. Like you know, people love these zombie apocalypse movies where we're reduced to some ancient way of living. So we kind of fantasize about this, but people don't really, all you gotta do is take people's electricity away for a few hours and <laughs> you find out that they don't want The Walking Dead. Um, but it's hard, it might be hard, you know, the, you know, the paradox might be the more we have, the easier our lives are technologically and financially, um, the harder it is for us to directly see where we, where we matter. And this might be, incre you know, some of the issues you bring up about um, drug use and addiction and things like that, you, you know, it makes some sense that in the most affluent society that the people who feel like they're being left behind because their jobs are being automated and they don't really see how their 
able to, you know, to take care of themselves and their families are, you know, the people the mo that are the most vulnerable because it's not like they're going to just go back to an agrarian way of life. You know, that's already been taken away. And so it is a challenge, this, and you see this tension. And, you know, there is research on this where people, you know, the more people feel existentially uncertain as well as economically and socially uncertain, um, the more vulnerable they are to mental health issues. Um, so, yeah, it is a, there is a trade off to. <laughs> To affluence that we, you know, some level needs to be managed. Um, uh, just one, one quick um, example that we can all, everyone will sort of understand. It's like saying you can imagine somebody being, being a rich trust fund kid. He has everything, right? He's, you know, he's got access to everything he wants. But that doesn't mean he's mentally healthy and you know feels meaningful or that he has a role to play, um, you know, being rich doesn't automatically insulate you from, um, from mental health problems. In fact, it might make you vulnerable. So you can imagine somebody who's working class or much poorer than that, than that rich person and actually thriving more psychologically um, because they have challenge, they know what they're doing, they have goals, they, they have a function to serve and they know people are depending on them. So I think we're really, really good about focusing on material needs and thinking about money and food in our bellies and things like that. But that's only part of the story. We also have to think about our social health and our existential health. And sometimes those things can ironically be intention. In, in the question about whether uh, primitive societies have less anxiety, I, I almost detect the presence of the ghost of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau, the 18th century Enlightenment philosopher who dissented from the idea of progress and uh, believed that primitive peoples were necessarily happier than his very late decadent 18th century society, which by the way had none of the modern conveniences that we now enjoy. Uh, even, even 18th century level technology to him was simply too much. It was simply uh, depraving of our morals and of our manners, and that what we really needed to do was to go back to the time when we slept under trees and ate acorns and were happy about it. And uh, needless to say, Rousseau himself never did this, nor, nor did he ever live with the people whom he romanticized. He had this fantastic idea that uh, primitive peoples everywhere had to be much happier than what he was, but uh, it has to be acknowledged that Rousseau was not a terribly happy person. Uh, he really wasn't. Um, it, it may be the case that this is a, a type of mental formation that uh, presents itself to modern people simply because of the fact that our societies are changing so much. Our society is doing it, Rousseau's society was also doing it. And that fear of technological and cultural change may very reasonably lead us to a longing for stability, and yet trying to fix that longing for stability in some remote past that we formerly enjoyed might be a kind of trap. Uh, it might not lead us to anywhere fruitful, and I, I am concerned that, in fact, it doesn't. As to uh, the phenomenon of uh, depression, uh, suicide, anxiety, uh, centered around drug addiction, uh, I have a few words about that as well. Uh, we are now seeing an epidemic of addiction that has primarily been focused on uh, rural areas in the United States, small towns uh, far away from uh, the big cities. Primarily, it's been white people. And I think it's been very interesting to watch this talked about as an existential crisis rather than as a criminal matter. When the crack epidemic occurred, we did not stop to ask about the existential questions in communities of color. We just treated them as criminals and tried to lock up as many of them as possible, and now we are living with the aftermath of that. And it is the white, uh, the white drug addicts and the white sufferers who get our sympathy and our concern about, oh, uh, well, maybe life doesn't have enough meaning in it. Uh, I would suggest, though, that they were more similar than uh, we would like to admit, these two addiction epidemics, and that Indeed, 
the phenomenon of mass drug addictions tends to proceed in ways similar to uh, infectious epidemics. They have a trajectory in which there is a rise and a fall. And that perhaps these, these phenomena are not so tied to the existential questions about meaning as we want to think that they are. Uh, they are products of people's social networks encountering a new substance and it getting passed around and uh, everybody's trying it. And then we see the consequences and we say, well, wait a minute, okay, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. And uh, nowadays there are uh, antibodies, as it were, against uh, people wanting to try crack because we all know that it's really dangerous. And uh, pretty soon we will be similarly culturally hardened against opiate addiction, at least for a time. And then maybe that will recede and something else will take its place. Uh, but I don't know that this is something that is really so closely associated with the kinds of deep philosophical questions that we want to get at. Right. Uh, since Phil's question is sort of germane to, to this debate, I, I just want to push both of you just a little bit more on this. Uh, first of all, Jason, I take your point that uh, uh, there are specific U.S. specific issues that we are dealing with, and we are not necessarily seeing uh, similar um, developments in other Western or advanced countries. But I just want to nail down one thing. The studies that show that people in advanced, richer countries are more anxious and more depressed than elsewhere, are those studies, uh, is that a hypothesis or is that a study that's already been done, um, that's well regarded, uh, that has a good sample? Um, in other words, is there 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 from, from your perspective? Yeah, that study's already been done. In fact, it was the one I was mentioning comparing the US to countries like China and Cambodia and Sri Lanka and um, Mexico, I think, where some of the comparison groups was recently published and it actually came out of the Harvard University's Human Flourishing Group um, studying these issues. So they measured, a, you know, they administered a bunch of questionnaires to thousands of people across these different samples so they could make these comparisons on different indicators of flourishing from economic and social to more existential and moral. Okay. Goodness. Uh, let's go to the left. Yes, sir, with the mustache. Actually, let's take both questions since you are there. Thank you. I'm Leon Weinchauger. I'm a retired member of the Foreign Service. We started out talking about anxiety. Uh, from what I know, there have been a number of surveys that showed, for example, the Finns and the Danes are among the happiest people on Earth. Uh, but from what I understand, those countries are characterized by low, re low religiosity, fairly high government engineering of society, fairly uh, extensive welfare states but yet these people seem to be very happy. How does this pattern, if you accept it, how does that fit in with what we've heard before? Thank you very much, and can you pass? Um, yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, Stefan Bielski, Professionals on Purpose. I have so many questions, but this being Cato, let me ask you, is the meaning crisis potentially a threat to freedom? We had this a century ago with totalitarianism, now people are talking about this term of algocracy, rule by algorithm, and that tech, AI, social media can uh, micro-target at scale the vulnerable. And that those seem to be those that are like uh, existentially poor, as I guess uh, Clay Rutledge would call it. Thank you. Please take it away. Yeah, so in response to the first question, I think this is something that libertarians should be particularly sensitive to. It's true that in these countries that are, in these Nordic countries that have low religiosity, um, there's a certain amount of social health and satisfaction. And it's because they have bigger government, which is what libertarians don't want. So this is my argument that you, you know, most libertarians are unique, first of all, and you have to be able to step outside oneself and think about, well, the way you think about the world isn't necessarily the way that most people in the population think about the world. And what ain't. Um, there's a certain amount of social structure that people tend to need 
to navigate the world. And we can do this in very small ways. We can, you know, this, there's a term outsourcing self-regulation, such as I don't, you know, probably drink as frequently or certainly don't eat as unhealthy as I might if my wife wasn't monitoring me a little bit. So even at very low levels, we have this kind of watching out for each other and helping regulate each other. And there is research showing that the less a society believes in God, the less they have a, a religious tradition, the more they look to the government. And so there is this tension in terms of people wanting some sort of structure in their lives, libertarians aside. Um, and so that, I mean, and so when you look at the world, you have to think about the reality as it exists, not how you imagine it exists in your head or how you wish everyone would be. You have to look at how people are and how human nature works. And that actually connects to the second question of, yes, I think the, you know, my concern about me, so I'm a psychologist, so I study what's inside people's heads and, you know, which is not surprisingly why I'm thinking about meaning in life as an intrapsychic resource. Of course, I'm thinking about the ways people get it from the social and cultural world, but that has a lot of meaning. It's demonstrably the case that meaning has a lot of self-regulatory power for all the things I said. You know, people who see their lives as meaningful, people who score high on a meaning life scale, regardless of how they got it or, you know, whether or not they're right or wrong that their life has meaning, that belief in one's meaning has powerful implications for their ability to govern themselves. They make better choices, they're better citizens, they're more helpful, they're more outward focused, they're less pessimistic, they're more optimistic. All those things are true. And so yes, I think that you, there should be concern that if you get to a point where people feel like there is no meaning, I, I think we see this a little bit now with some of the antinatalist and environmental apocalyptic types of movements in our society where people are es essentially giving up on the future, right? They're saying there is, we're dead in 10 years or 20 years, or I can't remember what the current um, estimate is. Eight and a half. Eight and a half. <laughs> so from that perspective, you probably shouldn't pay back your student loans and you probably shouldn't worry about much of this, right? But that's the problem, right? If you start to turn into a, this kind of retreat inward to this nihilistic state of nothing matters and I should just do what I want, you become more hedonistic. You become more self-focused. Ironically, this concern, you know, uh, supposed concern for the environment means that people, not all, but all, I mean, there are people that have very rational ideas about how to solve these problems. But this more cult-like mentality of the world's going to end doesn't make people inspired to want to do anything to fix it, right? It turns them inward and just makes them, you know, want to dance in the streets and do whatever they want. It makes them more hedonistic. So if we want people to be the type of citizens that make it to where we don't have to have authoritarian types of government structures, then people need to be able to govern themselves. And we need to study humans as they exist, not as we wish they existed. Yeah. Could I have of course, a follow-up? Yeah, there's, there's really a lot of confusing and contradictory data about religiosity versus secularism and whether the one or the other conduces better to happiness. The, uh, the Scandinavian countries are, are one part of the puzzle, but then there's the example of Japan, which is a relatively secular society, uh, and they have a relatively high suicide rate and uh, rates of, of anxiety and depression that are quite high as well when compared to Scandinavian countries. Latin American countries tend to be much more religious and they tend to have a relatively high self-reported happiness. So uh, it's complicated. It's not uh, like, aha, if we just get religion, we're happy, or let's cool it on the religion stuff and then we can be happy. It's neither one of those. There's, there's not a clear relationship. Goodness. Um, okay, gentlemen in the front, and then we'll move over back to you. Uh, thank you, Dave Rubinowitz. Uh, from a point of view of psychological uh, meaning, where does sports or competition in general fit in? Is fight, choosing a team and rooting for them enough to give meaning, and is there a problem with that? Yeah, I lived in the UK for a couple of years working at a research center there, and it was then that I fully discovered the power of sport tribalism <laughs> when I had a, you know, a good friend who was a successful psychologist, you know, uh, a good researcher, who his mindset about sports was unbelievable. I mean, he, he, he did not like people who supported the team that he didn't think 
you should support. Or, or <laughs> he did. So he was a he was a big Liverpool supporter, if that means anything to anyone. And I remember you know telling him one time, being like, "Man, it's just because I watched some matches with him, and I was like, this is you're not even enjoying yourself, right? This is you're basically in a fetal position in the corner." more terrified than you are joyous. And so, you know, I, I confront him about this and he's like, well, you don't understand what it was like growing up in Liverpool in the 70s and, you know, and this kind of stuff. So yeah, people do seem to um, find, I don't know if it's necessarily meaning, but certainly tribalism, you know, our tribal minds work this way where we attach ourselves to, to, to teams and ideas and, and things like that. And there is some evolutionary argument about, you know, the, the function of, of, of sports and, in society, um, but yeah, I mean, this is that reveals that I think you know that's a like a kind of a silly example, but it reveals the potential dangers of of conflicting meaning systems and meaning frameworks, right? Because if you can arrange a society in which we have mutual respect and say, hey, you're doing your thing, I'm doing my thing, and we all have you know you know which is a point Jason was making earlier, then that's great. But when the meaning systems become antagonistic, when it's like you, if you believe that, that's in direct opposition to what I believe, and that's a problem, um, then obviously you can get social conflict and war and genocide and things like that. It didn't reach that level at, at the, in the football games in the UK, but <laughs> there, was, there is violence, right? I mean, there, there is problems. Um, and some people think sports is a he is a healthier way to, I guess, have that kind of uh, tribal. Um, but yeah, I think there is a we have to be mindful of, um, of again, of human nature. Like we have to study humans as they are, both in the positive and the negative, to try to understand what's the best way to cultivate meaning systems that allow people to have health and connection and community, but not in ways that you know position them violently against others. Mm. Jason. Yeah, if you uh, search the, the great philosophical texts of, of the world for suggestions about what conduces to the good or to the happy or the well-lived life, you won't find sports fandom among the suggestions. But you will find participation in sports. You will find the idea that you should participate in competitive events, whether they are physical competitions or mental ones. You should participate actively in things like government or the arts or literature. Uh, it is good to discipline your body in terms of uh, health, but also in terms of mental well-being. And so rather than watching sports passively on TV, I would strongly suggest people go out and play. I mean, uh, I watch very little in the way of sports unless you count esports, uh, and I'm not even a huge fan of that. But I do uh, exercise and run competitively. I'm not fast, I'm not good at it, but I do it anyway because I think it's important to a well rounded life and because I enjoy it. Okay. Uh, well, I'm delighted to see so many questions. So let's make the questions even snappier and the answers uh, also shorter. So I'm going to take. Um, uh, th those two gentlemen sitting next to each other first. Uh, would you like to say anything about the, with respect to self-regulation, the, the relevance of Dunbar's number? Sir. Uh, yes, uh, Clay, maybe I missed it, but in your explanation of what you you were recommending as the sources of meaning, I didn't hear you talk about work. And I hmm. think in at least America, that would seem like there's something missing in your, uh, in your complete model. Thank you. Dunbar's number and work. Who wants to? Yeah, it's a barrier we need to overcome because the vast majority of industrial processes take more people than that. So we need to figure out how to get past it. Uh, if you want to have things like clean drinking water or uh, processed foods or uh, computers or cell phones, we've got to figure out how to overcome our lack of trust. It's a deficit to be uh, uh, rectified. And if we don't do that and if we revert to only trusting people under that limit of about 150 persons that we are postulated to naturally trust, if we limit ourselves to that, uh, say goodbye to the modern world. 
Yeah, I'm glad you raised the, the question of work because that, you know, that's correct. And there is actually a lot of a very good research on finding meaning in work that sometimes challenges, you know, people's intuitions about that because, and this is actually one of the reasons, and this will probably provoke even more contentious, <laughs> you know, um, questions. It, this is one of the reasons I'm kind of skeptical of UBI, to be honest. Um, I have, I'm... I'm open-minded to the idea of a universal basic income, but the problem is work does seem to be a source of meaning, even when people don't, because the argument against it is, well, people don't, people are doing jobs they don't like, right? And they're not, it's not meaningful to do these kind of boring, repetitive jobs. And though there's some, certainly some truth to that, where people get meaning isn't from the boring, repetitive task. They get meaning from that agency of feeling like they did something that they can provide for their family. So people want to have dignity in in the work, whether they're they're cleaning toilets or you know or doing complex engineering. And I don't know what the answer um, what the answer to that is. And there's also other you know other factors related to. To work, you can of course get meaning from lots of other things besides work, and a lot of people um, will say they get meaning, you know, not from their work, but from their, you know, from their family connections and from their religious connections. But people might be undervaluing, you know, we're not always so good at diagnosing where we get our meaning from, and so people might be undervaluing how much meaning they get from work. Again, not because the task is fulfilling, but because they feel like they matter, right? They're doing, they're playing a role in society, and they're contributing in a way. That, that that's valued, and I, you know, I don't know how we're going to approach that challenge with you know the future of artificial intelligence and automation. Well, one way to try UBI and make it less contentious is to try the state level first um, before we move it at a federal level. Um, so yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Herman Balma. I'm the executive director for the Institute for Objectivity in the teaching of evolutionary theory. And I think uh, a uh, major reason a lot of people today, young people today, uh, don't have meaning in life and don't have uh, a sense of right and wrong is because they've been taught in schools and universities that basically they're the result of random chance processes, which is the basic tenet of the neo-Darwinian theory of evolution. And I think it does have uh, tremendous ramifications for how students are viewing themselves and other people and just uh, whether they, there's any uh, purpose in life. And I think uh, one solution is to make sure that the theory, when it's taught in schools and universities, is taught objectively so that scientific arguments pro and con are presented and the students can exercise critical thinking, weigh the arguments, and make their own decisions. And I think if they start seeing the design and nature that's all around them, I think that can't help but have an impact on whether or not they think there's meaning in life. Uh, this is a set of issues that I did not really come prepared to talk about, so I, I think I'm just going to pass on that one. I, I don't know that I have a lot to bring to that that I'd, I'd care to share here. Uh, what is the education or you brought up self-esteem. Mm -hmm. um, who came up with that? So you, you said it's a question of the last 30 years. Um, is that something that came out of psychology? or? Uh, uh, but it did take a root in, in the education system in America. Yeah, that's correct. So there's an interesting history. There's actually a, a good book I would encourage people to read called Selfie by uh, a UK writer named Will Storr. And he... he you know, he traces this back to ancient Greece in terms of, so he goes much further back, which I can't, you know, I'm not a historian, I can't evaluate that. He, you might be interested in it in particular because he also implicates um, libertarians, American libertarians, and, you know, kind of being in, you know, part of the problem of creating this, like, self-oriented movement. Um, but really, in a, what I'm more comfortable talking about is its modern form in psychology, which might make all of you think, well, I'm not going to listen to what Clay says. He is a psychologist. He's about to say how psychology got this all wrong. But it was, you know, psychologists were implicated in this in the self-esteem movement where 
it was a good story. It sounded good. It took root in California, started in California education. It was a good story to liberals because this is a way to solve income inequality and all sorts of other um, inequalities in our society. If we can boost people's self-esteem, they'll be more successful, right? And they can overcome the hardships of their life. It was a good story to conservatives because it's really cheap. Right? It's not going to cost any money. You just got to tell parents and teachers to boost kids' self-esteem. So America seemed to like this, you know, on both sides of the political aisle, this idea of, of, of the self-esteem movement. Um, but it turns out it wasn't well empirically supported. And I do think there are lessons to learn from it because what it, it fits so perfectly in our individualistic culture to believe that we are the architects of our own destiny and that we can, you know, if we just look inside ourselves, we can find the answers and inspiration and do what we want. We don't have to answer to others. And that sounds good, but it just doesn't, I mean, it just doesn't square with either evolutionary um, psychological thinking or just, you know, decades of quantitative research on, you know, how human social life functions. So, okay. Uh, let's do last two questions, uh, gentleman in the yellow shirt, and then gentleman in the middle. Lunch is coming, fear <laughs> not. Hi, I'm, I'm Michael Krohn. Um, I was just wondering if either of you have heard about or had any comments on Joseph Campbell and the power of myth, because a lot of what I'm hearing, especially even with the Denmark example, is that... Uh, you know, I would tie it to the Denmark example that maybe in Denmark, people feel like they're giving when they, through the government, you know, support a lot of social programs. Whereas I wouldn't feel that way. And I think it might be common in America not to feel that way. Um, and then, you know, there's other things. But how does that tie into the meaning? Thank you. And you, sir. Yes. Yes, you. I'll make this quick. So how we haven't really talked, we've talked about many uh, facets of this, but we haven't really talked about gender. Uh, we've seen in much of the data that you've been discussing and some of the uh, harmful effects that we see maybe this crisis of meaning, we see it disproportionately among men. Do you have any thoughts on how gender affects this crisis? Thank you. Yeah, the... I won't go into all the details of my thoughts on gender because you said to keep our answers short. But yeah, I do think it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting challenge that I, I think there is something going on related to specific threats to masculine sources of meaning. And maybe that's unavoidable the way society uh, is, is changing. Um, but yeah, there are, you know, there are indicators that um, there's also indicators that, you know, women aren't necessarily, you know, happy either, or, you know, either like for, there was a New York Times story that reported that, um, you know, fertility is declining, but um, it's actually not because people want to have fewer kids. Women aren't having as many kids as they would like to have for perhaps arguably a variety of reasons. So I don't think these challenges are, are, are specific to men, but the um, but the idea of the traditional male, like getting meaning from work and from providing and, and from also, you know, protection, you know, from, you know, being a source of, of protection for your family and your community. Um, the, world, the world is changing. And so um, these are, I think these are interesting, interesting challenges. Um, I'll let you take the other question if you... I thought so, the Joseph Campbell question. I, I haven't read the book, unfortunately, and so I really hesitate to, to speak about it. I don't want to say something ignorant, so I'll, I'll just back off, I'm afraid. All right. Well, look, uh, I don't think we've solved the, the issue um, uh, before us today. However, I have to say I was fascinated by every minute of it, and I'm deeply grateful to both of you for your contributions. Thank you.